Hello and welcome to the DD Hangout Show. Today we're talking to Leslie Rosenberg, Research Manager at IDC, and Rahul Takala, Network as the Platform Business Development Manager from Dimension Data, around an IDC vendor spotlight paper that Leslie produced, titled Evolving Enterprise Networks for Future Lifestyle Life Cycle Initiatives and the Importance of a Life Cycle Approach. There are slides accompanying this presentation. The link is available on the Google Plus event page or simply go to slideshare.com forward slash dimension data. Please remember, if you have any questions, post them on the event page or on Twitter using the hashtag DDHangouts and we'll answer them live on the show. Okay, over to you, Leslie. Great. Thank you, JJ. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are around the globe. And uh, thank you, Dimension Data, for inviting me to uh, share, share some of this content with you. Before we start talking about the network, I'd like to spend a few moments talking about the ITC industry or what IDC entitles the third platform and uh, setting the stage in terms of the construct of, of really how the network is playing today. What we're in the middle of is a really interesting paradigm shift, something that we really don't see that often, especially in networking. And we're in the middle of it right now, something that we've last seen maybe 20, 25 years ago. And the first platform, which IDC entitles, is the, the world of the mainframe and the terminal. Maybe many of us didn't even have our technology careers happening at that time, but that was the basis of what was happening oh, almost 30 years ago. Moving into the second platform is the LAN internet and client server environment. And it's interesting to think about that there are certain technologies and certain manufacturers that only exist because of the second platform. For example, Cisco, HP, IBM, and Microsoft would only exist because of the second platform. What we're seeing today is, as we step into what we call the third platform, is this emergence of four key pillars, cloud, mobile, big data, and social business. Together, what we'll see is this interesting amalgam of technologies and solutions built around these four key platforms. It will enable unique, innovative industry solutions that will be based on the third platform. We'll see new players in the market, again, arising from third platform technologies. And we'll see this, we'll see an, an impact on um, vendors, on channel partners, and as, as well as how enterprises think about their infrastructure investments. With, with regards to the third platform, by 2020, IDC believes that, will be a, that investments or spending on third platform technologies will be roughly $5 trillion, almost $1.7 trillion larger than it is today. And we're seeing that third platform uh, technologies are growing 20% faster than the majority of traditional IT to, to encompass almost 80 to 100% of all IT spending. So as a result, it's, in, it's, it's making increased complexity, increased complexity on the network, and it's making uh, or causing CIOs to really rethink the impact to their organizations as a result of third platform technologies. So in the old world, we saw systems, but now we're talking about services because of cloud. We're talking about IT agility, again, thinking about the network architecture or the IT architecture, moving to business agility instead of IT agility. And not just the ability to deliver information to business constituents, but how to be innovative with your IT infrastructure. So all those paradigms are making quite a complex IT environment, especially on the network. And as a result, we believe that to be successful or to be able to extract maximum business value out of the investments, we believe that a holistic view of IT networks and the applications going across those networks is going to be essential. We believe that this is a result of increased network complexity due to the impact of third platform, such as mobile, collaboration, and cloud greatly impacts what's happening on the network. So it's essential that there has to be visibility and understanding to be able to be agile to uh, continue to deliver to the business. It's important to understand the workloads, the capacity, the velocity, as well as security are essential components in this third platform paradigm. But really importantly is the development of a plan, a plan for network consistency to be, late, to be able to deliver to customers as well as employees to deliver on the third platform. And, it's, and we find an essential first step is to leverage 
assessment services to understand what's happening on your network, to build an inventory of your assets, the ranking and status of all the devices, and a roadmap for future health and maintenance of your infrastructure. By taking this added step, it, it, it allows you to have increased, increased visibility while de in decreasing any risk, which is really essential as, as we have that demand for an always-on, always-accessible uh, uh, culture. So that we find to, in order to make this happen, there has to be continued investment in software and service automation to ensure delivering, to have a, um, successful delivery on, and reaching service level agreements to the business. The building or having access to intelligent service platforms to allow businesses to scale um, and to, in order to scale, you, you, it gives you the capability to, more, uh, to be more agile and increase profitability. We're seeing that investments in these types of invest, uh, assessment type of services will continue to grow. This is a very strong area within network consulting and in, in the integration market, and will grow at a CAGR of 2. Point, excuse me, 7.2 percent, specifically in the U.S. through 2017. And lastly, um, uh, is is taking a very uh, pragmatic approach, a life cycle approach, which we believe is the best way to really understand what's happening with your investments. It ensures that there's continued alignment not only within the network, but the network to the business. It has the capability to limit unnecessary network sprawl, over-investing, and not under-utilizing investments. It allows you to contain cost. allows you to optimize your network infrastructure to allow you to increase your competitiveness while reducing risk to the business. Again, having a very holistic uh, purview of what's happening on your network, as well as uh, constantly linking in to the business to ensure that you're delivering. Uh, with that said, this can be unwieldy for many enterprise organizations. So we believe that you're leveraging a third-party services firm, such as Dimension Data, that has a repeatable best practice to really uh, utilize um, uh, tested and true methodologies the, the ability to continue have a dialogue about what's happening with your infrastructure, to continue to provide uh, guidance as well as insight for uh, strategic, uh, a strategic roadmap. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Dimension Data and Raul Takala to talk further about uh, what Dimension Data is doing uh, in their developments around this area. Great. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, thanks for that uh, introduction. Um, you know, uh, we really appreciate, uh, you know, IDC's report because uh, actually Dimension Data has been in the, the assessment business, if you will, for about five years now. Uh, we've had our technology management assessment offering uh, available uh, since 2008. And, uh, in the five years since it's been available, we've done uh, in excess of about uh, 1,500 of these uh, for clients around the world. And, you know, just a real quick advert about the, the TLM assessment. It's, it's a point-in-time assessment where, uh, you know, kind of a very focused, uh, perspective engagement where we come out, uh, we're discovery-based, and uh, we discover a client's network. Um, we then use that to do some analysis and, you know, bounce that analysis uh, in terms of, you know, life cycle, uh, security vulnerabilities, uh, OS version management, that kind of stuff, right, where we can then combine and provide the visibility of that network uh, to the client to help them, um, A, uh, operationally, right, so it helps give them a vision of what they have in their network, how old it is, what potential issues and vulnerabilities they have with it, and, and can then help them with their uh, planning and evolution over time, right, so there's a very good operational uh, bit to it. But there's also a good bit of that data can be leveraged to help drive, um, help their thinking, if you will, around some of these um, uh, third platform uh, issues that, uh, that Leslie talked about, right? You know, how do I incorporate, you know, what I need to do with my network to accommodate things like cloud in the next 18, 24 to 36 months? Same with mobility and end user compute, right? Because we can't think of evolving the network just within the context of, okay, uh, uh, my device has now run through its, its three to five year useful life and it's time to refresh it. 
Um, we need to refresh it within the context of these of these changing architectural trends that are out there. Right? So that's basically what we do in the in the in the TLM assessment. That that sort of visibility and that guide uh, guidance uh, to help them establish that long term. Um, the other benefit, quite frankly, that comes from the TLM assessment that process is uh, we've actually uh, because we do so many of these, we actually um, uh, track. Uh, let's say the counts of some of the findings we have, and we um, report on those findings in our annual network barometer report, right? And uh, so what we do at the end of every year, we're actually in the process now of putting together our network barometer report for this year, which is coming out here in the next uh, couple of months, um, is we sort of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, consolidate uh, the findings from the previous year's TLM assessments and it kind of gives us a great snapshot in terms of, generally speaking, how networks are looking around the world, right? Um, so, for example, uh, last year's network barometer report, which um, uh, consolidated the data from the 230-odd uh, assessments we delivered during calendar year 2012, covering some 60,000 discovered devices. Uh, one of the key findings we found in there is that nearly half of all networking devices that we discovered were past end of sale, right? So these devices uh, are, are the ones that uh, the vendor has now said you can no longer uh, buy any of the, uh, another one of these. If you want to buy a similar device, you have to buy the, the new version, if you will, right? And once a device enters the you know end of sale or life cycle um, uh, process, it generally has a, has anywhere between five to seven years of useful life, right? Until it reaches the point of last day of support, meaning, you know, if uh, if the thing breaks or you have an issue with it, don't call the vendor because they don't support it anymore, right? So you now are sort of on warning from the, from the vendor that, you know, this thing is going to slowly age, so the longer you keep it in, in your network, potentially the more risk you're taking on, and so you really need to give a lot of thought to your operational support for that device, right? And so we found that interesting because uh, that we found it interesting that about half of all devices were were obsolete or now in that obsolescence cycle because that had been a slow trend. If you go back three or four years ago, um, we were finding that only about a third of all network devices were actually in the obsolescence cycle. After a steady trend, it's now almost half. Okay, and to a certain extent, that made sense to us because. You know, with the general um, sluggishness macroeconomically, you know, there's there's a lot of data that points to um, uh, network uh, spend being related to GDP. You know, it, it didn't surprise us that clients were, say, uh, uh, you know, purposely sweating their networks a little bit long. Okay, so so that generally makes sense. But what we were also finding though is that as you know, they were sweating these devices, you know, to where, to the point where almost half of all devices in their network were past end of sale, we're also finding that about 25% of those assets were what we were calling late stage uh, obsolete, meaning you're getting to the point now where you're end of software maintenance, you're approaching last day of support. So really, again, the risk, if there's a failure there, really goes up for it, right? So we're in this window now where, again, it made sense over the past couple of years that clients were, sw were sweating their assets, but we're now feeling we're on this sort of fulcrum point where, you know, it's probably really time now because as, you know, 25% of your network next year, probably 35% even more get to those really late stages, probably the risk is going to start outweighing the benefit of, of delaying that spend, right? So that, that's on an operational side. Um, now, getting back to some of the things we're talking about in terms of the third platform, so this concept of of networks getting just generally older has an implication for those uh, for these you know third platform uh, issues. So let let's just take mobility as an example, right? In this concept of of everything really being um, uh, wireless access networks, right? Pervasive wireless connectivity. You know, if you think about the impact on um, access networking over time, you know, if you if you go back just even five years. If you thought about the way you would design your average, you know, campus network uh, and your access switches, right? Eighty percent of the ports in those switches uh, would be dedicated to, you know, dedicated wired uh, connections, right? Dedicated wired ports, where twenty percent of shared devices like wireless access, right? 
that's as recently as three to five years ago. But in a, in a world where, you know, you need pervasive wireless access, right, where everyone is connecting, not just with their laptop, but they're connecting with their smart tablet, with their phone and everything, that, that architecture, that access network architecture, by definition, has to change, right? It's going to need to change from 20% wired ports and 20% to wireless or if shared ports to, right? So where only 20% of your ports now are, uh, are wired ports to dedicated users and 80% are going to, you know, 11N access points, right? Or AC access points, because everyone's now going to be connecting that way. So, so that really has profound impact on uh, how you're going to design your network going forward, right? So uh, on the one hand, you're probably going to need fewer access switches. Okay, so that's that's the good news. Um, but those access switches now, at minimum, are going to need to have three basic characteristics. The first is uh, they're going to need the support power of Ethernet, right? Because the, the access connecting to that uh, port's going to need um, power uh, over Ethernet. Um, it's going to need a, a gigabit Ethernet port, right? Uh, the gig E, uh, you know, think about 802.11n and now 802.11ac, you're now talking about these access points having throughputs from 300 megabits to 800 megabits, right? So a fast Ethernet port at 100 megabits is going to do you no good. You need a gig E on the client side. And then finally, with more and more of these high-speed access points coming in through fewer ports, the uplink from that access switch, which is now currently probably... Uh, a gigabit is probably going to need to be upgraded to 10 gig, right? Because you have fewer switches, fewer ports, but more traffic coming through, right? So the uplink into the network now needs to be able to have traffic. You know, your oversubscription from ports to uplink um, is going to have to reduce, right? So, so again, so you need, these access switches are going to need to have power reconnect. They're going to need gig ports on the client side and 10 gig on the so getting all the way back to my TLM assessment and our network barometer report, some of the data we found is that while wireless is clearly in the, in the uh, market adoption phase, right, you know, wireless access points, uh, our own bookings are going 30% per right? We're not seeing the same impression in the access network nowadays, right? What we saw in that last year's network barometer report, you know, getting back to the, the figures I was talking about, um, only 50% of all ports actually support power of Ethernet, right? Uh, only about a third of those ports support gigabit Ethernet on the client side. And only about 11% of those uh, of, of those access switches support 10 gig on the up -end, right? So what we're seeing is that there's a lot of investment going on in the edge, right? As, as it should be, a lot of access points being put out there, but not a commensurate investment going on in the access network, right? And, and what the implications are for the third the, you know, the third platform trend of mobility and what that really means from an overall, you know, network architecture perspective. And I'm not saying for a second that, um, you know, that just having power over Ethernet and gigabit Ethernet and 10 gig uplinks, that that's all you need to handle the, the, you know, the third platform of mobility. But there are at least table stakes. So what I'm saying is you can't necessarily think about mobility and end-user computing without thinking about the impact that that's going to have on your underlying network. And I think that's really what us and I kind of say here, is that, you know, these big architectural trends are real. We see them happening. Um, but we just want to make sure that, you know, clients understand that there's a, a domino effect here and that really you can't look at your network without taking these trends and these third platforms and different So I think that's me, JJ, um, at least for my structure comments. I don't know what's uh, well, that, that was a great example with mobility, really illustrating really the impact of the third platform. That's, that was terrific. I think um, as enterprise customers really, uh, as, as they bring in their own devices or, or they have company-owned devices, again, accessing data anytime, anywhere, moving more towards cloud strategies, um, taking that first step, you know, understanding what's happening at least from a mobile perspective or wireless LAN perspective is, is that first entry point. Again, it's a snowball effect, these companies pounding um, third platform technologies, but you know, not doing the homework on your network really uh, makes it challenging or will make it very challenging for enterprises to, to um, realize uh, the benefits um, if their network isn't really supporting and ready to go. So that was a great example. All right, thanks.
Uh, JJ, I don't know if there were any questions or you know how you wanted to proceed from here. Okay, hold on. Uh, let me just see if there's any questions that we have. Um, I'll get back to you now. Leslie, you don't have anything else you want to discuss while we just compile some questions together? No, I can always discuss many things. But <laughs> uh, um, uh, with regards to, to third platform, um, some of the technologies or, or, or technologies that I mentioned earlier, such as unified communications and collaboration, mobile, um, data center virtualization, and the movement to cloud, as well as data, and as well as big data, um, I think, you know, as they're coming together, as I mentioned earlier, it just becomes really, really overwhelming for many enterprise customers to understand how to prioritize, how to set a strategic roadmap in terms of inter, uh, the interweaving of all these technologies and what that means. And um, you know, we believe that it's really essential that, you know, not every enterprise can handle this themselves. So it's really important that they spend some time working with a, or investigating the ability to, to work with a, a third party services firm. And, and the reason for that is just because these firms have the capability to work with all types of enterprises around the globe in all types of verticals. And so it allows to bring a very repeatable process and gives some, um, assurance to the enterprise that they that they've seen this before and really importantly I think as we move forward and I think this is a really interesting trend amongst many services firms is that that they can not only talk about the network architecture which is really important but have the ability to have a broader more strategic consulting type of conversation about the business and being able to bring these two aspects together so that so it makes sense. Um, so not only talking to the to the network manager, IT manager, VP of IT, or CIO, but it, enable to talk to line of business to really understand what their care about and needs are for their business constituents. To have the conversation with the CFO to understand consumption models, to understand capex and opex requirements as well as, as as many stakeholders as possible and to bring that together strategically to, to set the roadmap. And then from there taking that information to lay the, the network for a solid network foundation because otherwise none of the care abouts, none of the, the uh, business requirements or the desires of the business can be met unless there's the solid uh, infrastructure under, un, underpinning. And not every services firm has that capability to do that. Now, now they, uh, they may not necessarily have that skill set um, um, to understand the business as well as the technology, and the, that's a really important point. Um, as well as the tools that Raul talked about, the, again, those repeatable processes and insights into the infrastructure, into the network, and really be able to have that detailed conversation, again, to uh, be able to actualize. Um, what the, those investments bring. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, Raul, I'm going to switch over to you. I'll take it you've got some questions ready. Um, so over to you. Uh, yeah, I did get one here. Actually, I got two. Um, so the first question was uh, if I could provide an example from a network architecture perspective, you know, like what, what so using the mobility and the act on um, access. How does cloud, you know, so, you know, where does cloud fit in in terms of the implications uh, from a, a basic perspective? Um, and that's a timely one because, you know, from a dimension data perspective, obviously we're a cloud provider as well, as well as building wide networks for clients. And um, interesting enough, you know, some of the discovery data that, that we uncover uh, in, in our uh, TLM assessment offerings you know, relates to um, so CPE out at your branch offices, right? And the and how your wide area network is 
design. You know, five to seven years ago, when, when most of these, you know, wide area networks were designed, you know, 90 to 95% of your traffic was going to a private data center, right? Whereas nowadays, uh, upwards of 50% of your branch aren't headed to the data center. They're actually headed to the cloud somewhere, whether it's Salesforce or YouTube or something like that. So what we're finding is lots of clients are now routing their traffic, their branch traffic, through these expensive wide area networks through to their data center only to then flip them around and send back out to the internet, right? Um, so th here's a classic, again, another classic example of, you know, where uh, uh, the third platform of cloud is having an impact on the underlying network infrastructure. You know, we're now in the point where when we are discovering, say, you know, a we discover a CPE router, let's say, out of a branch that is, um, you know, past end of sale, it's probably going to go last year support in the next year or so, and the client's immediate sort of feeling, need your reaction, why don't we just refresh that router? And so it's a good opportunity for us to say, okay, well, hang on, you know, we would be Glad to sell you that router. Don't get us wrong, but at the end of the day, let's make sure that what we're doing with this next gen WAN or uh, WAN design is taking into account the traffic patterns you have, right? So let's make sure that you know we are uh, accommodating the fact that fifty percent of your traffic or more is now headed to the internet. So from a routing perspective, let's make best use of those MPLS circuits that you have, right? And let's make sure, moreover, that the router that we are going to put out there has the intelligence that's necessary to do that sort of real-time packet forwarding. Let's make sure that we send the traffic to the right place that gets the right quality of service and end user experience that's necessary. Right? So I think that's, a, a, again, like the mobility example and the effect that mobility is having on campus lands, right, you know, pervasive wireless, you know, here's an example of where cloud is having a significant impact on how clients really need to think about the design of their wide area network. And so, Sorry, Raul, you just broke up there. Could you just say that last bit again? Uh, okay. Uh, hopefully, uh, so this is just another example here of, you know, a, a third platform like cloud and its impact on the underlying wide area network that we can't just kind of take how we did things in the past uh, and just say, okay, here's what my wide area network now needs to look like in the future. You know, we need to rethink both are uh, the, the routing equipment we want to put out at the branch, as well as the overall design uh, in terms of what's the best use of MPLS links versus internet broadband. And okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so do you have any other questions? Yeah, actually, I had one other. Uh, the other question that was, uh, you know, if there, you know, if I could expand a little bit on, um, you know, I had mentioned earlier in my talk about how you know, one of the things we do as part of the TLM assessment is just give visibility to our clients in terms of how old their network is, right? How many devices they have that well, and where they are in that life cycle, right? And I think that um, uh, you're taking on more risk at longer the device, right? And so someone, uh, the question I got was, can you expand a little bit more by what you mean by more risk? And you know, really plain and simple, you know, when we talk about life cycle, right, so if you just take Cisco's life cycle categories as an example, you start with end of sale, so at that point you can no longer buy that device, right? It progresses, it gets to something called end of software maintenance. What that means is if uh, the version of iOS that it's running has a bug, uh, Cisco's not going to fix it anymore, there's going to be no bug fixes for that, right? And then as you progress on a little bit further, uh, you get the last day of right? And the point at which when that device, uh, it, when and if that device fails, that, you know, you can't even really call the Cisco TAC anymore to get support, right? So when I was talking about taking on more risk, you know, there's clearly a financial argument or an economic argument to sweating that asset, right? Because you know, at the end of the day, if it's, you know, don't fix what ain't broke kind of thing. But I guess my point is that the longer a device goes through that cycle, the greater it is that if it fails, that it will be, you know, your mean time to repair to fix it uh, will go up, right? Uh, that is, unless, of course, you have an operational support plan, you know, that involves things like sparing and, and, and the like, um, that ensures that you can uh, get that device up and running uh, in, in a short amount of time, right? And so that's what I was referring to in terms of risk. It's risk, 
devices say more likely to fail just because it's older. It, it's really more a case of if it is older, you better make sure you have the right operational support model for it so that if it does fail, you're not sitting around waiting for a device that, oh, you know what, I actually can't buy another one of these things, so what do I do? Right? And that leads to, like I said, lengthened mean time to repair uh, for these uh, that are financed with a, a unplanned purchase, <laughs> right, of a bunch of equipment. Generally speaking, when you have to buy it, buy that stuff, uh, due to so it's all that kind of stuff. So that's what I take. All right, perfect. Well, thanks, Leslie and Raul, for joining us on the show. Um, and thanks, everyone, for watching. Please remember to download your complimentary copy of RDC's Vendor Spotlight that was discussed on the show. Um, the link has been posted on the event page. And feel free to contact Raul Takala via LinkedIn for more information. So thank you, and have a good day. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks for having me. Bye.